There we go. Good day and thank you for joining us today for the webinar. We will be sending this recording to you after in an email, so watch out for that. Welcome. Kelly, can you kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good day. It's still morning here in California. Um, I'm Kelly Watson, and thank you for joining us on this webinar. And Max, I love your comment already. Yes, welcome to the California lockdown. <laughs> um, so we want to try to make this interactive. There are a lot of participants, so just a little, a few ground rules. We'll be using the webinar chat, so feel free to put your questions there, and we'll do our best to manage that. Um, we're also going to, if, if we... Um, have somebody, if we're, we're going to have a couple of times when we call on you to speak. Uh, in that situation, put your hand up and we will moderate um, who we will unmute to speak and ask a question verbally or participate and share a story. Okay. Um, so if you don't want to participate also, we're totally fine with that. Um, we understand though that probably a lot of people are feeling a little bit isolated right now. So we're hoping this opportunity will, you know, send some warmth from our two coasts and, uh, and make everybody feel a little more comfortable. So welcome. Hi, everybody. I want to introduce myself. I'm Jody Detchen. As you can see, the lower left-hand corner oh, and a bright, sunny day in Boston. Um, right now, I'm in my office in Boston. But I am co-managing partner of Orange Grove Consulting and also a professor of management at Suffolk University. And really excited to hopefully give you some pointers today, something that you can actually use in this time of whatever we want to call it. So excited to be here with you. Kelly. Yeah, so I first wanted to just share, um, I'm sure everybody has some COVID-19 stories right now, but we wanted to share some of the experiences that we've personally had over the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, I'm also a, a professor at Loyola Marymount University in um, California here, and I'm in charge of an international trip that um, got canceled while some students were in flight on the way to our destination country abroad. And um, we pivoted and made a local residency and, and quickly got speakers and, and sort of did basically a year's worth of planning in about a day and a half to um, provide a different experience for our students. Partway through that experience, uh, one of our students ended up taking sick and um, several days later had tested positive for the virus. So that put us into a quarantine a little earlier than the rest of the country went to. And um, unfortunately continues to impact because um, my daughter who is a high risk heart patient has actually contracted it now. And so we're managing through that. So yes, this became super real, super fast for us. And, um, and but I wanted to share sort of some great insights that that has helped um, us come to as, and I'm sure your businesses are going through a lot of the same kind of swing in the last little while. Go ahead, so Joe. what are we gonna do today? First off, we want to tell you a little bit about us. We specialize in research-based leadership development and bias removal. So basically our role in life is to make organizations and people, frankly, more free, more free of all the dross that we've put on top of it. And we think that like right now is a good time to actually get rid of some of this stuff because we have some time to actually reflect on it and move it out of our way so that when we come out of this seclusion, we actually can come at it with a lot more facility and freedom. So what are we going to do today? So today, the whole idea for us today is so that we can share some of our thinking on this. We want to help you, we want to first define and then help you get this magical mindset. Kelly termed that. It's just this idea of looking at this from a totally different perspective so that we can sort of take the brain's narrative from ah, crisis mode to something a lot more open. We also want to remind you and hopefully give you some recognition of this idea of um, self-efficacy and how we actually have a lot more power than we think. And then finally, how you can to help you develop a bite-sized goal orientation so you can take this at one step of the time. We've got, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about this idea of crises as a job interview. Then we're gonna go into a vision of what crisis leadership can actually look like. Then we're gonna talk about and define this magical mindset. 
We'll talk about Crazy's confidence, and then we'll wrap it up with the action plan. But I want to start with a quick question. How many of you are working home for the first time? And just do a show of hands. How many of you are working home for the first time? Yeah, my, my screen is filled with hands raised. <laughs> I can't even count how many hands are up. It's like most of you. It's really phenomenal. It's interesting because Kelly and I were laughing because her and I have been actually working remotely for the decade that we've worked together. We've written two books remotely. We constantly, I don't even know when we first met each other in person. I think we gave each other these huge hugs because we had built this incredible business and personal relationship and it was all virtual until we met each other. But um, so it's possible, doable, and actually we've both thrived in this. I always call Kelly my sister from a different mister, but here we are at opposite coast and I don't actually really see her in person very much. So it's possible, doable, and we're gonna try to take some of that energy that we personally get from it and share it with you today. All right, Kelly. All right, so wanted to talk about what, um, what happens during crisis, right? Because you've got lots of different types of people. Some people are, super calm and other people are running around like chickens with their heads cut off. And um, I wanted to share a little anecdote. I uh, was working for a big company um, that got bought by another company uh, earlier in my career and my boss got fired and the new boss came in and um, everybody's running around and going crazy. And he, he, he complimented me on the fact that I wasn't. And he said, you know, what the people out there don't realize is that this is a real time job interview. This right now we're watching. And of course, we're going to consolidate and reduce heads in this, in this, um, in this environment. That's why companies buy other com companies, right? And um, they, he said, we're looking right now as to who has what it takes to lead through a crisis or lead through this. And I thought, wow, that is so impactful because I don't think people realize that what they're conveying right now and what people are reading around them is actually has such a long-term impact. So I wanted to just share some of the data with you on this. Um, I, I thought this is a curious topic. So, um, you know, first of all, I found this study that found that grit and growth mi uh, mindset actually positively impact career advancement. They've actually done longitudinal studies on female heads of independent schools and found that those with grit and a growth mindset, which are um, maybe hard to measure, but they've at least proposed some measurement for, um, for that and have correlated to long-term career advancement. There's also a significant relationship between resilience, job satisfaction, and turnover. So folks who um, people have indicated are more resilient um, seem to have higher job satisfaction and lower turnover. And this again was um, for nurse leaders. So also a, um, a very stressful job, very stressful environment. Especially now. Especially now. And the final one was that um, effective organizational commitment actually decreases the likelihood of an employee laid off. So this is something where somebody is conveying their commitment to an organization and um, and does that by speaking positively about the organization in terms of crisis and supporting the organization in terms of crisis instead of sort of sitting there with their arms folded, um, boy, this organization can't do anything right. So, so I think all of these are super applicable right now in what we're conveying to everyone else. And so, and I, we get that it's not easy, but um, obviously having the mindset or at least having this as a goal is, is something of particular um, importance, especially right now. Yeah, so let's think about what this actually looks like. What is the vision of crisis leadership? So I want everybody to pull up their chat set area and type in, when you think of crisis leadership, what are the descriptors? What are the adjectives that you would use? So type it into the webinar chat area. What ideas, comments, words come to mind when you think of crisis leadership traits? And they make them good. I don't want the positive, the negative stuff. When you think of a, somebody who actually is envisions or emboldens it, but communicative, empathy, calm, look at this, adaptive. These same words keep coming up. Realistic, focused, holistic, knowledgeable, honest. I like that one. Facing okay. facts, truthful. Look at that. Yeah. It's amazing. You guys are coming up with all these words. Like these are the words. It's so amazing. A mistakes is learning opportunities. We know what it looks like. We have a very clear vision of what it looks like. So cool under pressure. 
All right, so what I want you to do now, and keep that chat room up, because I'm gonna ask you in a couple minutes to write some things down. I'd like you to get out a pen and paper. Um, you might not have a pen and paper. You can also use your phone and use your note area. And what I'd like you to do is I'm gonna read you a story about Jacinda Arden. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of characteristics of how she handled that crisis down in Christchurch that was so horrible. And as you're listening to what I'm talking about, I want you to jot down the characteristics that you hear. What do you hear that she's emboldening, that she's exhibiting, that she's role modeling? And then I want, and then we'll talk about those afterwards. So first off, they looked at why did she have these skills that she showed, this aplomb that she showed, this humbleness that you, you all identified. She was raised by a police officer and a school cafeteria worker. So there was a strong, um, there was a strong sense of community and giving back. So service matters. She also wanted to be this moral leader. And she wanted to confront the most vexing problems that we're facing. A few hours after the attack, she addressed the terrorists directly with words. She said, you may have chosen us, but we utterly reject and condemn you. The next day, she wore a black headscarf, met with Muslim leaders, and she asked them, what would you like us to do? She says, quote, our time is for you to determine, unquote. She hasn't shied away from naming racism. She hasn't shied away from saying Islamophobia as, an, as, a, as a root cause. She addressed parliament for the first time with an Arabic greeting of Asalam Alaikum. I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly. She basically came out with sympathy and empathy, but she also didn't stop there. She said she was more interested, in, she was interested in more than just this gesture of tolerance. So she made an explicit connection with what's going on with social media. She also talked about how, you know, something that Americans feel unthinkable. How do you, she built this consensus of, to create a gun ban in, in New Zealand. So when you think about this, exactly, just exactly what Bush did after 9-11, built this consensus. So what are the characteristics? What are the skills that she used that you heard? What did you hear that she did? What did you hear in my story of Yacinda Ardun? What were the actions that she took? Exactly, she was inclusive. Very much so. so. She didn't leave anybody out. She brought people together. This is a powerful move. What else did she do? She was very direct. She had solidarity. She connected directly to the people that were affected. So she brought in some of that empathy. She knows her own worth. She lived compassion, immediate action. She didn't wait. She took immediate action and very mission-driven and empathetic. So funny. We're going to talk about all of these things. So I'm so excited that these are coming up. The adaptability. Yeah. Because it's changing every minute, right? Exactly. So she showed us in how she responded. And note the word, I use the word respond and not the word react. She showed us in her responses what you can do in terms of crises leadership. And here's the thing. This is an ideal. Yes, she was a bridge. Absolutely. This was an ideal. So, so I also want, and we both are really big advocates of this. Don't look at her and go, oh, I can't do that. We want you to look at this as these are attributes to aspire to. So it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect in implementing them. We're learning as we go. So maybe we pick one thing that she's doing that we can aspire to. But the idea is let's think about what it is and then we can decide what we want to do. Great. So now I want to talk about this idea of mindset because I think before we react or respond, we first have to be in the right mindset. And it's really challenging when things keep getting thrown at you every minute to kind of keep that mindset open and keep it, um, and, and keep it magical in a sense. But it, the one cool thing about it is we actually can control our mindset. We can, we can take charge of the narrative that's going on in our mind as long as we understand that, there, that it's a mindset, right? That the mindset shift has to happen first. So I wanted to share with you that there's, um, can you click the next yeah. please? Thank you. There's um, three components to this magical mindset that I wanted to share. Two of the components are positives that we can do. And the third is kind of counteracting what not to do or kind of a negative. So I'll start with the first. The first is um, a belief in our own ability to be able to solve problems and, and have self-efficacy during the time of crisis, right? So it's, it's almost a, the word is not confidence as much as it's a positive self-concept, that relationship between our own core evaluations of ourselves and our ability to cope. 
If we think it's impossible, if we think we don't have the skills, then we are not going to have the skills. But just controlling the mind and believing and remembering that we have the skills actually makes a big difference. The second is risk tolerance. And, and this one I've often struggled with because I'm not a risk taker, right? But, um, but having an openness to a new experience or a tolerance for, hey, you know, we're going we're gonna to do some things that we don't know the outcomes to right now. And we don't have time to sit down and measure it out and do a spreadsheet. But really, we're just going to have to take some risks and, and go forward. Um, so folks who have that openness to being able to take risks are actually better suited or that's the mindset that's better suited in this environment. And then here's the one that's the, the, the kind of the negative, which is the resistance of cha to change. Um, the more we're resistant or the more our mindset doesn't like change, the more difficult this is going to be for us. Um, we, the willingness to be able to initiate and respond positively in a dynamic environment is, is a big piece of what's going to happen here. And I think I, you could probably share with us some stories of folks in your environment who've got this low risk tolerance or right? they or this um, inability to take risks and this inability to have change. You know, some of those folks have actually blocked the, um, oh, I can't work from home. My job can't be brought, done from home. And it's kind of funny because in a really short time, we found out that a lot of people's jobs can be done from home. And a lot of the, the barriers that we had in our mindset are really all just gone, right? We've just kind of proven it. But this, um, this mindset, this, this, um, the, the ability to open up and go with the flow and say, hey, you know what? We're going to try it. Let's try it. What can go wrong? I mean, and right now we kind of don't have a choice. So it sort of is almost opening up and allowing that mindset to be even easier. Hmm. All so right. So what we want to do here is- we All right. You... This is what I wanted to do. Okay. Go ahead. You go, Kelly. I'm sorry, I thought it was mine. Um, I wanted to take that last point, this idea of the, the fix or the close uh, mindedness and the resistance to change. And I wanted to do a little exercise here where we actually take, take a moment to rate ourselves. And I did this and I, I found this kind of interesting because <laughs> I, I truly think of myself as somebody who, you know, I like my way, I like my routine, I like, I like things to be the same. So, so this is interesting. There was an, actually a study that showed that people who were more able to cope with change had a positive concept and high risk tolerance. And, um, and a lot of it came down to this resistance to change piece. So let's take this apart. So just on a scale of one to five, just take a pen and pencil uh, and write this down, but um, evaluate yourself on each of these points. So the first is reluctance to lose control. You know, I will say I am a control freak. I'm admitting it, but this is one of those things that if, <laughs> if you're a control freak, you may um, be you know, struggling through this process because you're resisting the change and the change is happening so fast, it's like you're drinking from a fire hose. Um, but uh, stressing about stuff that you can't control really is almost um, a wasted emotion at this point because, because we can't control it, right? So there's, there's a piece here where, um, you know, you may be resisting it just because you can't control it. You might just be resisting decisions even because you weren't part of them. So make a note of that too for a moment from now because there's the, th that has an implication for how we wanna, you know, maybe draw people out. Now, if you're really good at this, maybe have a second list going for somebody that you're working with who's kind of spinning and in a panic and, and then we'll compare the two. But one to five, your reluctance to lose control, five being true, okay? Write that down. Yep, write that down. We'll ask you to give us the total at the end, so just write All it right, down second on a piece of paper separate. Yeah. All right, second one is um, this idea of cognitive rigidity or dogmatism. So if you are a person who feels that this is the way we always have to do things, and, and it's tough because you may feel like, well, that's just my principles, right? My principles are this. But when it actually gets to a point where cognitively you're so rigid and closed-minded and fixed that and, and thinking in a black and white way, you're, you've actually maybe blocked out other potential solutions. It's we can work from home or we can't, or we can, um, you know, we can either give people sick time or we can't, right? And that dogmatism actually is creating a barrier for the process of change in yourself. So write that one down. Think about, and, and be honest, because you don't have to share. You don't have to tell us. <laughs> The third is this idea of lack of psychological resilience. 
So if change for you is something that stresses you out and makes you lose sleep and um, you know, has a physical impact on you, then you would rate yourself highly here. Lack of phys physiological, uh, uh, psychological resilience. This is one of those where it would rate highly if stress doesn't invigorate you. If you're a person that's like, bring it on, this is the greatest. If this last week and a half has been the greatest time in your life, then <laughs> that would be rare perspective. Okay. <laughs> it would be a rare perspective. But if you're on fire, you know, I mean, there are some people. The dean of my college is on fire right now. I have never seen her so invigorated. So she rates really low here. Um, but some of the rest of us are like, well, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I can feel it. I'm, you know, sleep's disrupted, that type of thing. Then that would rate yourself a little higher here. All right. The, the next one is if you're intolerant to the adjustment period for change, like, you know, change has to happen and you can see it. And we've got to get everybody from A to B, but you're just really frustrated with that process. Like, come on, why can't we just be there? Why can't we just, you know, change tomorrow? And, and believe it or not, that's actually a barrier. That's actually a resistance to change is the inability to tolerate that there's going to be an adjustment period and that not everybody in the world is going to be in the same place on that adjustment period. Um, yeah, so rate yourself there. And again, I, I think I rate myself. Kelly, there was a question. About <laughs> what about feeling the pain of the world with saps energy? So I think the key is, is that you have to actually differentiate and discern what is actually di draining you. So if you're drained because of the stress and the uncertainty, then that's one aspect. If you're drained because of the overwhelmness of the world, I think that's, that's not on the scale. That's a totally separate feeling. And I think it's really discerning the difference between the two. That's how I would, that's how we would differentiate it. And, and I would also maybe put that back a little bit into number one, that, um, you know, what's happening in the broader world is, is somewhat out of your control, I would say. Um, but there are pieces of it that we can control. So we're going to focus our energy there and we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, but that's a good one. That's a good point. It, being sad for what's happening in different um, areas of the world and to different people is absolutely adding some stress to the situation. All right, the next one is this idea of preference for low levels of stimulation and novelty. Let's face it, some of us love to hurl ourselves out of airplanes and skydive, right? <laughs> My daughter's like that, it scares me. <laughs> I'm not one of those people. I, you know, I like to come home and have a quiet evening at home with a book. That's my idea of a good time. So, um, so there are folks like that, that, you know, that believe it or not, if you prefer low levels of stimulation and novelty, you're less, you're, you're kind of high on the resistance to change piece um, because novelty doesn't, it's, it kind of goes back to number three, novelty doesn't drive, drive you the way it does for some people. Next one is, um, Reluctance to give up old habits. This one, you know, pe people are notoriously um, stuck on habits, right? And it's been, it's hard to break habits. And we all know that with some of the classic ones, you know, um, stopping smoking, stopping overeating, that type of thing, getting a new exercise routine. But the folks, some folks can, can shake it up and can break habits and create new patterns. And other folks are just, you know, a little more reluctant than others. So if you're one of those people that just kind of has a hard time breaking habits, then you're going to be high on the resistance to change piece. Okay. So total them up. What's this tell you? What's this suggest? How I'm, might you help? I'm yourself? high here. I'm high. And so I'll, I'll just throw that out there. This is yeah. been a, a big taxing couple of weeks because I don't see myself as being, you know, one of those bring it on change people. <laughs> Just let's, let's ask a couple of people, don't tell us your scores. We don't want to actually know your total scores, but tell us an area that you think is particularly difficult for you and just show that if you don't mind, or if you want to say something that's particularly easy for you and share that. Let's just hear from a couple of people. Yeah, losing control is a big one. I think a lot of people, it's very, very difficult and often starts from a, from a, um, Position of one down, you know, it's in our stomachs almost. Number four, intolerance. Yeah. It's very, yeah, and we're going to talk period. about all of these. Yeah. Yeah. Psychological resilience. Yeah. Intolerance to the adjustment period. Mm-hmm. 
Thank you all for being honest. This is really nice to hear people sharing honestly, because what this is telling us is how many people we're all here together, right? We're all, we, nobody is, you know, has only six or at least I don't know anybody that has only six. Yes. And I think this is a good point. The um, entrepreneur has to push your numbers long, lower because you're all about innovating and finding the opportunity. And then others are like used to being out of control. So, so, so just like you're seeing Jeremy's putting here in the text, he's used to being out of control. This is a skill. That's like fundamental to our work is that all of this stuff can be learned. This is not things that we're born with. We are trained and socialized to have these things. And so we can learn otherwise. And one of the key things that we do in our work is this idea of reframe. It's like foundational to us that, in fact, we have a new book coming out on reframing both at an individual and organizational level in terms of inclusion. It's coming out in November. So we'll tell you more about that later um, in a couple months. But basically, the, the point about reframing is that we take these assumptions, like the ones that we, the six that we just talked about, and we question them. And we say, why is it that I have to do this? What is the underlying belief system or assumption that I'm holding on to that I keep doing it? So in our work, what we found is that bad habits are really the outcome of these hard held assumptions. And the way out, the way to change the bad habit is actually to find the hard held assumption and reframe it. So let's walk through this. And because that then becomes the, the, the basis for your new habits. So Kelly, why don't you tell us how to reframe these? Yeah. Great. So the, the big one, right? This control piece. This is, this is the big one. Um, a lot of us are control freaks, right? We have this reluctance to lose control. And the assumption under this is that somehow by being in control or somehow, first of all, that I am in control and, and there's a, you know, being able to discern between what I can control and what I can't control is a huge piece of this. That's a huge piece of the thinking that needs to, to go down, right? Is um, that I actually have control. And there's far less that we actually have control over than we self-believe we have control over. So the first one is the, re the reframe here is exactly what Jeremy said, control what you can. Take the time to understand what is in your control and what isn't. You know, my daughter was very upset that her um, driving test was supposed to be in a couple of weeks and it just got canceled. The DMV canceled it. And um, she was really, really upset because her permit's going to expire before then and everything else. And I said, look, you know, you have to believe you're not the only one in this situation. They're going to find a solution. And stressing about it is not going to change a thing. Let it go. Yes, it's disappointing. That's disappointing. But it's not something that you're going to spin around about because you can't control it. The, the decision is so far out of our hands. And I think there's a lot of what's going on in the workplace right now that is really people spinning about stuff that they can't control. So control what you can is number one. A second one, if we're talking about this cognitive uh, rigidity or dogmatism, um, this is really about fixed mindset. And Carol Dweck has done a ton of work on um, fixed and, and open mindset and growth mindset. And what she's learned in her research is that growth mindset can actually be created and controlled by, like it's something that we actually can develop. And um, it, it isn't going to happen overnight, but if you practice small opportunities and small things for opening the mind, it can actually, it can actually be done. So, so the reframe there is open mindset is possible. You're not born with a fixed mindset. It's created and it is absolutely something that you can, you can develop over time. All right. The third one is this lack of resilience, the psychological resilience. I wanted to tell you something here, uh, a parable, right? About um, a man with a horse. Has anyone heard of this parable? It's, it's kind of an interesting, and, and I, I've really been practicing it, especially during this crisis. So it starts off that there's an old man who's super poor and he lives in a tiny village and he has a beautiful white horse. And the villagers are always saying to him, you know, why, you know, why do you have this horse? You could sell the horse, you're super poor, this would be, there's a temptation to sell it. But he said, no, the horse is, is my horse and, and I'm not gonna sell it. So one morning the horse isn't in the stable when he goes to see the horse. And the villagers all come and say, see you fool, you were poor, you should have sold your horse, you could have had money, but instead now somebody's stolen your horse. And he says, you know, it, 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 and they say that this was bad, right? This is a bad situation. And he says, we'll see, we'll see. And then um, a few month or so later, the horse returns and he brings back with him a dozen wild horses. So then all the villagers gather and go, oh my gosh, it was brilliant that you didn't worry about your horse because now you have all these horses and look at you and everything. And he says, 
we'll see. And then his son um, began to try to break the horses and he was out there in the field and he's breaking the horses and he falls off and he breaks both his legs. And then the villagers all throw up their hands and say, see you foolish old man, now your son has broken both his legs. If you didn't have all those horses, your son wouldn't have broken his legs. And he says, we'll see. Then the um, country goes to war and everybody's sons have to go join the army. And it's pretty clear that the war, that, that, that the sons are basically being led to their deaths in this war. And this man's son doesn't go because his legs are broken. And the villagers say, ah, oh, you know, you were right all along, you know, at, um, good for you. You're so lucky. And he says, we'll see. And the point there is, and it's very much based in sort of Buddha, Buddhist philosophy is, look, you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. So, so stressing about it and worrying about it is completely irrelevant. It is what it is. Practice neutrality. We'll see. And, and I can't tell you how many times the last week and a half I've said, we'll see. <laughs> we don't know. It sounds terrible. Um, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Um, yes, and it is a Chinese parable. You're right. Thank you, Jeremy. All right, the next one is intolerance for the adjustment period for change. So for this one, um, can you show me the reframe, Jody, please? Yes, <laughs> this one really is about um, being frustrated with the process and, um, and, you know, the reframe for this really is just to acknowledge that, to acknowledge that if, you're, if your assumption is that it should be easy and we should be able to skip to the next step and that nobody's going to have to do any work. Um, and in fact, it's funny, in a lot of the courses that we teach in women's leadership development and some of these things, which, you know, you'll notice about our courses that they are multi-session and there's coaching in between. And our point here is that you, you really aren't going to be able to do this work instantly, right? This is not something that's going to happen overnight that you attend a webinar or you go to a course and you come out and you're like, woo, I'm resilient, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's work. And yep, it's hard work. It's deep work. Um, some of the criticism we've had for some of our stuff is it's too hard. Okay. Um, you know, we can get through it and we can work on things a bite at a time, you know, but Yes, it's actually hard. It's hard work. So the, the, the reframe here is to acknowledge that it's, a, that it's work and that it's a step so that you actually dig in and take those steps. All right, the next one is this idea of low levels of stimulation and novelty. And, you know, this is the one I have to tell myself because I like that too. I like, you know, <laughs> I, I'm very comfortable in my comfort zone. And every time I do something that I think is scary, you know, the first time I had to get up in front of an audience of a thousand people and speak, you know, that's, that's scary. Most people list that as pretty high up there on their scary things to do list. Um, the first time I did it was hard and, you know, absolutely out of my comfort zone. The second time I did it was a little bit easier. And now I don't really think about it um, because because I've now grown my comfort zone, right? So I started out with it being outside my comfort zone. Then it started to be on the edge of my comfort zone. And now it's just a comfort zone thing. It's, something, it's a skill that I built. And so the point here is that if you're going to grow and if you're going to push yourself in life, it is going to be uncomfortable in the beginning. And that's how you know you're learning. That's how you know that, that we're on the, um, on, on the outside of our comfort zone, right? All right, and then the last one, I wanted to just talk about this thing about habits, because I heard this when I was taking driver's ed when I was a kid, and our driver's ed instructor said, it takes 28 days to form a new habit. And so he wanted us to stop hard breaking and doing all kinds of things. And I thought, you know, it's interesting. This is an interesting concept, because um, giving up habits, um, the best time to start that 28 days was 28 days ago, right? But the second best time is today, is actually right now. And, and Jody has a saying that I always love that when we get into something hard or we're doing some development work, her phrase is, you know, the only way through is through. And I think that's such a good one because you can stand around and you can noodle it and you can talk about what a disaster it's gonna be, or you can just plunge right in and then your 28 days starts ticking today. Yeah. So what does it actually look like? What does it mean? I think one of the things, and this came out in some of the comments here, is we've got to get through this with each other, that it's together that, that we're going to get through it. 
it's even though we're in isolation supposedly in our houses we're still together like we're on this webinar together we see each other and so many people are using zoom and other webex to actually look at each other and talk we're still connecting because when we put our arms out and we ask for help like kelly was talking earlier you know she needs eggs so she's got an entire network of people that are going to go out and buy her eggs because she's not allowed to go out because she, you know because they're in in isolation and so people coming together it's amazing what we can do. And the impact of teamwork means that we have this oxytoxin release. And this totally reduces the hormone, the cortisol hormone. Last week, I had my own um, travel seminar. And we went out to Silicon Valley with a bunch of students. And uh, every day, it was another crisis. Every day, there was something else. But I was telling my husband this morning, what's interesting is that I actually feel closer to my clients, closer to the clients that my students worked with every day. Like, we went through something together. And so, therefore, we have a, a stronger bond. It's really, really cool. I love Melanie's comment here. Control doesn't really exist unless you're out of it. All we can do is manage things the best we can. And this is the coolness about this, is that once you start getting it and realizing it's a skill, it actually works. Jeremy, you raised your hand. Do you want to, uh, uh, Daphne, can you unmute Jeremy and have him speak? Sure. Um, just find him. Yeah, we've got a lot of people in the webinar, so she's just got to find you. <laughs> oh, it was a mistake, he said. Somebody yeah. else had their hand up? That's all right. We'll, we'll continue, and then if you want to keep your hand up, Daphne can find you, and we'll, we'll type you in in just a minute. So there's another aspect to this. Kelly? Yeah, I wanted to talk about this concept. So um, early in this process, um, I was fortunate enough to have um, a Navy SEAL, an ex-Navy SEAL, a retired Navy SEAL, come and speak to my students. And um, he told us some just incredible stories, right, as you can imagine. And one of the things he talked about was during boot camp for um, Navy SEALs, you know, they have this five day, really intensive experience. And they're already, the soldiers that go to boot camp for Navy SEALs, as you can imagine, is they're already the best of the best, right? And then they have this five day session. And the first day, this, they start on a Sunday, and it's a really hard day. And then they're kept up all night and they're submerged in the water, in water. And they're, um, you know, they basically have the worst possible night of their lives. And then they, they go hard again all day on the, on the Monday. And um, the thing about boot camp for Navy SEALs, I guess, is that um, if you ring the bell, you're out, right? If somebody goes over and rings the bell and says, uncle, then they're out. And the whole point, so they'll start with 70 cadets or whatever, and they will, um, They'll, the whole job is to get them down to a small handful. So they're doing their best to get people to quit. And um, they, they say that the inflection point or the point where most of the cadets quit is actually on the Monday evening as the sun's going down. And they get two basic mindsets. One mindset, the quitting mindset, is, oh my gosh, I have five more days of this or four more days of this. I just had the worst 24 hours of my life. I can't do it again. I'm out. The second mindset, the one that tends to be able to thrive and survive is, okay, I made it through the last night. It was the worst night of my life. I can do this. I've got what it takes. I've done it before. Let me just get through the next night. If I can just get through the next night, I'll worry about the next three nights after that. And this really resonated with me because as a marathon runner, I sort of do the same thing. You know, I don't think about mile 26 when I'm hurting. I think about the next mile marker or the next water station. And I thought about this compartmentalizing and how it can actually bring an incredible sense of calm to know that you're just focused on a small bite, right? Now, the other thing that the Navy SEALs have found is that the ones who reach out to each other during these times of crisis, they, that togetherness that, um, that Jody talked about, there's actually a phenomena that happens where oxytocin is released from the brain and it actually spreads and actually can be felt subliminally by others. And so by reaching out, if you are calm, you actually can literally people around you can catch the calm. And they think it's related to the hormones or whatever, but the point is calm is catching. We have an opportunity if we're calm 
to have that spread to the people around us. And if, and conversely, if we're jumping up and down and panicking, then that, you know, the same, the same emotion is going to be picked up by the folks around us. Yeah. And so then what ends up happening is we help, we can perpetuate this calm by actually communicating, communicating, communicating some more. I told you last week that I was on this course with my students. And so every day, the, th the whole virus thing started escalating the whole time we were there. And so every day I tried to keep them informed, like, here's where we are. Here's where it's at. This is what's happened. This client is canceled. This client can't come. This, we can't go to this client's place, but we're going to go to this place. I just kept them informed the whole way. And I gave them the meta communication as well so that they could see the big picture. Like, this is what we're trying to do. And I also told them, look, you're gonna get such incredible skills out of this. So I tried to bring it down to even if everything goes and falls apart, what you're learning is adaptability and what an incredible skill you have for the marketplace. So by communicating and then communicating and communicating, we can ask questions. How are you feeling? What's up? We ask a question every day at the beginning of the day. How's everybody feeling? How are you feeling mentally? How are you feeling physically? We talked about what was going on. And then they told me any uncertainty that they had, where they were feeling unsure. And if they were really unsure, sometimes they'd pull me aside. But we, we had this open dialogue. And so this is something that we can replicate. I was just talking with um, some people earlier today, and we were talking about you know, connecting every day, even showing you know, the face-to-face -face so that people, you can check in, what's up with you? I know you're in isolation, what's up with you? And it makes such an incredible difference. Kelly. Yeah, so I wanted to um, I wanted to also say that about communication that one of the things that you know was an early miss for us as our international program was changing rapidly and, and we were shifting to this on the ground domestic experience and then shifting that online as um, you know people got sick um, was the idea that even if you don't have something yet to communicate, communicate. So sending out a pre-communication that says, okay, I don't, I don't have the answer yet, but we're, we're working on it and we're going to communicate with you. And the importance of that for being able to um, stabilize and calm a situation when everybody's sort of sitting waiting for your next word and you may not have something yet. So, um, and, and that was something we missed early and it was called out. And so we adapted and said, okay, we're gonna need to you know, do a better job at this because people started to make up their own <laughs> their own decisions that were not necessarily what was in keeping with what we need to do. So then I wanted to shift to this idea of values-based decision-making. Um, this is something that, you know, it, I've been watching this and, and my school is a Jesuit school, so we're very focused on um, ensuring that our decision-making is aligned with our values and that we're not, that nothing goes out that is seen as, um, and I've seen some incredibly mercenary stuff going out lately from other places. And um, it is, it's kind of surprising to me because I do think that this is a time when you do want to display your values. And we're seeing such great examples of it. I'm wondering if um, anybody actually has some examples that they want to share. I, I know that, um, I, I heard that uh, a company was actually contemplating layoffs and ended up taking their executive salaries and the, the top executives in the company gave up their salaries to cover everybody's salary in the interim to get them through this, this pandemic. So um, any other examples? Does anyone want to say anything? What have you seen? The good stuff. You seen? Share the good stuff. We need to hear the good stuff, how people are acting to help each other, the value, getting down to our core values and what matters to us. Anybody seeing any examples of this? I was, went to Whole Foods this morning and was just thanking the people that were working there. And, and they just said, thank you for coming. And I really, really appreciate it. And they were like, you're welcome. All right. By the way, we just wanna let you know we're gonna be running over a little bit. So just be um, prepared a little bit about this. No problem. If you need to drop off early, we will be taping this. So it's totally fine. What wow, is the that's CEO very... of Zoom? I, I missed that. It... Yeah, I don't know what that is. Sherry, can you share what that is? I don't know that story. Oh, Sharif. Redirecting oh, race snacks from canceled races. I like that. I've oh, even heard Zoom. some employees are selling the groceries from their cafeteria. Very Giving cool. schools free Zoom. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's very cool. It's just, those are kinds of things that make us feel so good. And, and it just, 
this is what we need to do, right? This is the kind of stuff that allows us to do things. The other thing I want to say is we've got to drop the perfectionism because yeah. in times of crises, and frankly, Kelly and I would say anytime we should drop the perfectionism. We're really anti-perfectionists. But the idea is, you know, why do we have to be perfect? We're in the middle. We're just, we haven't really practiced this before. It's not like we had a dry run. We're all just in this together, figuring it out. So let's drop the perfectionism. Let's figure out what is it that we can do? What is it that we've done before that we might be able to apply it this time? It's really kind of cool. So as we start to think about, I, I use the example here of the ugly carrot still tastes good in soup. It's still nutritionist. It doesn't look gorgeous, but it still gets the job done. So that's what we need to do. And I'm loving looking at these examples that people are um, typing in here, all the free subscriptions and the generous relief pay. And it's just such a cool thing. Such a cool thing. All right. So okay, let's, get let's get to, get action. to the action. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So the first piece of this, and it's, probably ironic that we're talking about it while we're in the middle of the crisis, but it's an important piece and I'll tell you why in a sec. But the first is, is that we do need to plan, right? Um, and, you know, backup plans are something that probably got dusted off <laughs> in this crisis. And, and in some cases, I have one client that was running around like chickens with their heads cut off and was then reminded, well, there is a plan for this. We do have a backup plan. Um, can you, you know, we should be following it. And even the, the top executives were like, what? We're, we're supposed to appoint a flu manager? Wait, we're supposed to, you know. And, and so, so the big piece is, you know, to make sure that there is, if there is a plan, get it out and use it right now. Because um, somebody has spent some time, some time doing this. And if you don't have a plan, we'll get there in a second. But, you know, start with the plan. The second piece is actually preparing and, and rehearsing. So, um, when my daughter took ill this week, we had to leave the house and go to get an x-ray. And um, we showed up at, at, and we had to go see her doctor. We showed up at her doctor and we found like the protocols were kind of a little bit loosey-goosey knowing that we were exposed cases. And it was interesting, but you know, there was one level of, pre it, it was sort of like there was preparation, but it was kind of sloppy. We went to get an x-ray and <laughs> let me tell you, we walked in that door and said the words COVID-19 and they went, great, go to this factory, follow us, took us right back. Everybody was in total scrub gear. They completely, you know, cleared out the area, put her in for the x-ray, then wiped the whole room down. And then they walked us back out. And I said, well, hey, don't we have to pay? They said, nope, out the door, we have you. <laughs> and I was just like, That's funny. what that showed me is that not only did they have a plan, but they had practiced that. They knew exactly what they were doing with us when, they, when we came in the door. And they wouldn't let us touch a door handle, nothing. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. So, you know, you absolutely want to be able to, to have practice it. The third is this idea that Jody was talking about, about communication. And really, it's considering all of the stakeholders that are involved 360 degrees around the plan. Um, and, and not forgetting, you know, the impact that this is going to have to the broader community. And, um, you know, we don't get to throw out our sustainability plans just because this is happening. It's, it's what are all the stakeholders. Or and inclusion. Then, or inclusion. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a really great point that this is actually the opportunity to leverage inclusion, not decide that that was something that, you know, we did only when we were business as usual. And then the final piece of this is to actually debrief what's happened and have some kind of humility. And back to what Jody was saying about perfectionism. If we let perfectionism stop us, hey, we didn't respond well day one. If, if we allowed that to, you know, to not respond day two or to, to stop the plan or worse to dig in, to become dogmatic and say, no, we said we were going to do this. And now the conditions have changed. We would be in, you know, a lot further behind the curve, right? The only way to stay ahead of this curve is to do that postmortem and say, okay, we could have communicated better. We could have done something better. What are we going to do next time? And here's the piece that then feeds is the next prevention plan. So scenario planning doesn't stop now, right? We're in the middle of it. 
And the first COOP plan, that is Continuation of Operation Plan, which I'd never even heard of until this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> but the COOP plan now is getting revised on a daily basis. And we need to go back into planning mode so that we're ready for the next eventuality. I remember when we, they canceled our international trip and they said, you know, they might close the borders. You might not be allowed in. And we laughed and said, that's such an overreaction. And we were supposed to come back from our international trip yesterday and the borders were closed. Like, come on, <laughs> yep. it happens. So you've got to go into the next recovery plan. Now I can't take credit for that action plan, that, that action planning model. That actually um, I think is um, well-documented as a, as a model. And I know that several of my clients have been, have been implementing this right now. So I have borrowed that from them. <laughs> so I want to leave you with some real practical things that you can do to help your team. So number one is check in regularly. I, everybody's in their house working alone and it's really difficult. Now, some of us like Kelly and I have had a lot of practice with this. So it's a little less, we don't need to check in as much because we can do it ourselves. But people who, especially who've never worked home before, you got to check in regularly. My husband's downstairs. He's got his whole setup now and he's talking to his team. They're doing daily check-ins and it's making such a difference because he, you can already still feel how calm people are, have become because they're connected and, and life is, this little snippet of life is still normal. The second thing is create short-term project plans. Just like we were talking before, what do you need to do the next day? What is what can you accomplish today? Don't think about we two weeks. We don't. Sec, Jody. Oh, huh. Sorry about that. Where do we have to do? <laughs> where do? What do we have to do in the short term? What do we have to do today? What do we have to do tomorrow? Not what we have to do in two weeks. Two weeks, who knows what's going to happen? But what can we accomplish today? And also so that you can feel like you've got some progress, like you're doing something. You want to involve them in decision making. It's so funny. Why on earth are we not asking all sorts of people that work for us what their ideas are? Because people have all sorts of ideas in the times of crises, and they might come up with a really good one. Again, I was listening to my husband. He wasn't. He wouldn't be very happy if I was. He knew I was telling the story. He was. They were doing this conference call yesterday about a, something that they're changing in the policy, and the fact that they had multiple levels on the conference call made them hear all these different ideas of how to basically handle it. It also gave them the different perspectives. And so by involving them in the decision making, it made a difference in the outcome of the decision. And then finally, support your people. We saw a bunch of examples that people came up with, but it's also like giving people the confidence, look, I'm not going to lay you off in the next six weeks. Everything's fine. Let's just keep on doing it. It's okay, breathe. If we can support our people as best we can, giving them the technology needs they need, maybe sending them some food, however it looks, but we need to actually give people the support that they need. So we wanna leave you with a quote. And I think the quote really exemplifies what we're trying to say here. It's like, it's all about mindfulness, about daily gratitude. It's about who we are. I alone cannot change the world, but I can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. Imagine the power of what each of us can do if we just step into this and help each other and learn from each other. So Kelly and I want to thank you for joining us today. So what do you today. think, folks? What, what are your questions? What are your challenges? Yep. Um, let us know how we can help you today. Oh, show you the quote again? Sure. <laughs> yes, and we are making this available. So if you want to take this to your teams, we're happy to have you do that. So we'll, we'll make the recording available as well as just the PowerPoint. Right. right. We'll stay on if you have questions. If you have anything you'd like to just challenge us about. Thank you, Maria. Thank you all. We really appreciate it. But we're here for you if you want to ask some questions, if you have any thoughts. I'd also like to hear one thing that you're going to do today. What's one thing that you can do as you get off this, this webinar that you can help? Your team, yourself, your family. What's one thing you could do? Good. Oh, that's great, hall. Max. That's exactly really great. right. You know, it, if you are at home, I know that um, the tendency to want to, you know, be in your pajamas and not show the Zoom. But um, one of the things that we've mandated for all of 
all of our folks is we need to see faces because um, it's really important, especially leadership faces. We need to see your faces. Oh, I love your idea, Michelle. Yeah, involve them. Excellent. Oh, it's saying that's funny. A lot of times we think that 22 year olds are actually totally fine with this, but they're not. They've never really done this kind of work and they're nervous. So I think helping that younger generation is extraordinarily important. And leveraging them to help you with the tech. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> A virtual birthday party, dance party. That sounds fun. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Good job, Jeremy. <laughs> I'd actually dance right now, but I don't think you'd all like it very much. <laughs> Connect the family abroad, yeah. This is so fun. <laughs> I would. <laughs> yeah, I know. It would be funny, huh? especially if it was taped. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for, for your engagement. We hope you got some stuff out of it. We are really excited that you joined us and we look forward to continuing to work with you over the next couple of months. Have a great weekend.